Hello everyone, thank you for coming to this talk today. This is the final intern talk by Andrea. Andrea has been an intern with us for this summer on this special internship project on spatial audio. Uh, he's a PhD student at New York University and he will be talking about blind room volume estimation. And with that, Andrea, please. Thank you, Anis. All right, thanks for coming to my talk. My, the title for my talk is Towards Real-Time Blind Room Volume Estimation from Single Channel Audio Signals in Noisy Conditions. And the word towards here is important. <laughs> so let's move uh, to the outline. So today I'm going to give some background and motivation of why this project uh, was fought in the first place, uh, some previous work uh, and objectives that we derived from uh, literature, uh, our proposed approach, and we're going to go through our, uh, the data that we collected, the features that we decided to compute, uh, our prediction model, and the results. Then finally, we're going to discuss some uh, future works and improvements that uh, could be implemented, uh, some conclusions and discussion. So let's start from the background. So acoustic parameters, why do we care about them? Um, in mixed and augmented reality, virtual sources are desired, desired to be perceived as fitting with the rest of the user physical space. So we want in mixed reality real sources and virtual sources to blend together in the same perceptual space. So this would improve auditory plausibility, spatial audio immersion, spatial audio quality. So acoustic room tailoring can be achieved by using a, a room impulse response that is specific to the space in question. So we can measure room impulse responses and that will describe how does the sound behave for a particular source receiver position is inside the room. And uh, as you can see from the image, this is more or less the idea that uh, mixed reality wants to achieve. So you have a listener inside an environment and you want the virtual sound source to blend together with a real sound source. Um, However, room impulse responses are very difficult to measure. They require technical expertise. So uh, scientists have developed uh, synthesis methods. Uh, they can use acoustic parameters to uh, model an impulse response. So as you can see from, uh, from this image, I think uh, most of you are familiar, but I'm going to just give a brief overview. Their impulse response is made of a diffuse part which is independent of the location the response is taken within a room. And, uh, but the first part, the, there is a direct sound, an early reflection, that part is position dependent. So going to the uh, use case of mixed reality, um, we may want to, um, to create an, an adaptive algorithm that can uh, dynamically adapt to the position of the user within a space. So here we can see, for example, a school, and there's a, some uh, HoloLens users that wants to move around. Uh, from an auditorium, it moves to a corridor, then it moves to a room, moves back to an auditorium, and goes around the building. Each one of these spaces, they sound very different acoustically. So it is necessary to capture the parameters that describe the local acoustic environment in each one of these spaces separately. Um, the challenges of uh, this problem is that uh, blind estimations cannot make assumptions over the uh, local environment where somebody is present at the time. So, for example, in this image we can see many people wearing some sort of uh, mixed reality device and they're surrounded by noise sources. There's bubble noise, there's ambient noise, perhaps there's also fan noise. And uh, they might be all different devices where the, some of them have multiple microphones, some of them only have one microphone, maybe some of them have cameras. So we wanted to think about something which is more generalizable and simple for each one um, of these situations. So our um, approach was to think of situations to, to make something as generalizable as possible. Um, and uh, the, the way we decided to go is for single-channel audio-based estimations. Uh, blind estimation means there's, uh, we have no prior knowledge of the space. We have no prior knowledge of uh, uh, the sources around uh, the listener um, or the geometry of the room. So previous work on acoustic parameters has 
mostly focused on uh, two main parameters called uh, uh, reverberation time, uh, T60, or the DRR, the direct reverberant ratio. Uh, there's quite a big body of literature about bl the blind prediction of these two parameters. Um, and uh, other parameters have not been as covered as much as uh, the T60 and the DRR. But uh, the T60 is basically the time it takes for an input response to decay down by 60 dB. And the DRR is the direct to reverberant ratio uh, that describes the, uh, the ratio between the first part and the late part. More recently, literature has proposed a different way to uh, describe uh, an acoustic environment, and that is by the reverberation fingerprint. So the reverberation fingerprint is no other than a, a frequency-dependent T60 decay. Uh, coupled with an initial power spectrum and the room volume. So at the beginning of this internship, we started looking at uh, T60 and DRR, thinking, okay, maybe we can uh, improve the, uh, what has been done in the past. So these are the results of the ACE challenge in 2015. In, um, Back at the time, most methods were signal-based. Uh, there was not uh, much uh, machine learning into, this, um, into spatial audio at the time. So the best results were achieved by uh, signal processing methods. And um, up to 2015, uh, I, don't, I mean, the numbers don't really matter in, in, uh, specifically, but um, basically octave, spectral band-based, um, algorithms were the best performing. Um, recently, machine learning approaches have improved the estimation of T60. So these are the results from two papers. One is from uh, Hannes, and uh, another one is another paper uh, that came out this year. And these are two, um, two approaches that use machine learning to predict T60. And they show that uh, quite an improvement from previous method can be achieved. So they both outperformed any of the algorithms in 2015. So this quite, was quite an interesting thing to find because um, the, these approaches are quite new in spatial audio, and uh, uh, they are the first early attempts, but they seem to produce already considerable improvements. So we kept this in mind as we went forward. Um, one thing, uh, one thing to know that, that, that we took out of this is also that T60 is almost a solved problem. The current literature shows uh, really good results, and uh, of course it's possible to improve it, but uh, we thought uh, that there is the space to try to compute something else. Uh, the DRR, on the other uh, hand, it's, it's a parameter that is source position dependent. So if you estimate a DRR, you can estimate it for one particular source, but that doesn't tell you much about other sources that you want to render within uh, that local environment. So instead, we decided to, uh, to choose a different parameter, and that was room volume. So why room volume? Uh, room volume as a parameter, as an acoustic parameter, can serve as a proxy to obtain other parameters. So for example, uh, the critical distance um, can be described uh, by a, a formula that includes volume. And also the initial power spectrum that we saw from the uh, energy decay relief, which was the T60 decay. Uh, the initial power spectrum can be adapted using a ratio of uh, a reference volume and a local volume. Uh, and that work has been also discussed during the AVAR conference for some of those, some, uh, those of you that were there. Um, so it seems to be something that right now people are starting to think about, but there is very little amount of literature about the prediction of room volume. So we decided that this might be a good opportunity to try something new and uh, try to, uh, to see what's uh, possible to do using uh, similar approaches that have been used recently for T60. Um, one question that uh, we had at the beginning is whether we can hear volume at all. 
so this, these audio examples, they show uh, the um, dry signal convolved with uh, three impulse responses from three different rooms where the T60 was the same, but the volume was very different. So all the three examples, they have a, a, a T60 time of about one second, but uh, they have different sizes uh, in um, the, the rooms where they were recorded, they were all different sizes. So the first uh, room was only 100 cubic meters, second was uh, 900, and the third was 8,000 cubic meters. So I'll try to play the signals. The problem is that they're going to go through speakers, so you, we, we're going to hear the volume of this room on top of the volume of the room where it was recorded. Uh. This is the original signal, which was provided by uh, Professor Pulki. Uh. <laughs> this is the small room. Uh. This is the um, medium room. Uh. This is the big room. Uh. Right, so one of them, the small room, is clearly different. There's some, um, perhaps some uh, absorption, coloration is involved there too. Um, the medium and the, and the big, they're little, they sound more similar in this space, but if you listen to them through headphones, you can notice some, something different in the low frequencies. i just play them once more. So original, uh. small room. Uh. Medium room uh, and big room. Uh, All right. So that we don't know. I'm gonna get to that point later. Apparently not. If you go back and see the formula of critical distance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, that, that 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 that's one of the challenges. We don't know uh, the the data that we collected. Um, is mostly from data sets who, who, who do not provide that information. So, um, yeah, this, this is one, one case example, but uh, we produce more. That the T60 is the same, so they have a similar perceptual quality. The first thing you notice about the room is how reverberant is it. They are similarly reverberant, but the volume is different. So the pro their properties are obviously different because they have different volumes, but the same decay time, but uh, the question is, can you hear a difference just based on that one parameter that changes, which is the volume? Right. So um, uh, j j just by listening to these examples, we were thinking about what possible uh, um, representations could capture this information, and uh, we're going to get back to this uh, in later slides. So. Um, Previous work about blind volume estimation. Um, there's not as much uh, literature as for T60 or DRR. It's kind of a, um, it's been treated as a side problem, but uh, recently it's been uh, brought up again. Um, in 2012, there was a paper about room identification using generalized uh, uh, linear mixture model, Gaussian uh, mixture models, and uh, MFCCs. Uh, the problem with that paper is that this used the same rooms in the training and the test set. And uh, that, uh, as we can see later on, makes a big difference in your results. Um, they, they somehow achieved 23% error rate, equal error rate, I think. Um, but uh, the way they divided for uh, room, um, sorry, uh, impulse response location within the room. But having the same room in both sets, it's not really uh, telling you much, I think. What is GLMM? Um, I, think, I, I think Gaussian mixture model. GML. Yeah, I think that there's an L there for sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I gotta check that. Um, another paper by Shaptai uh, used an abrupt speech detector in speech signals to detect uh, uh, the end of a sentence of a word and from that moment in time treat whatever comes after as if it were an impulse response. So whenever a word was uttered, the end of the word, especially after 
uh, very sharp uh, um, consonants could be treated as if that was the input response. And by uh, um, selecting that uh, time frame, they would uh, uh, try to estimate the volume, uh, also using uh, um, Gaussian mixture models. And, uh, but that paper only looked at uh, uh, clean conditions, so free from noise. Uh, that uh, method was also brought up again from a, in a recent paper. Uh, where they implemented the, uh, the same method and they, and they trained it for a regression model. But uh, they only tested the, this, uh, this method on uh, ISM data, so image source method, um, image source model. So the image source model creates a very clean synthesized input response, which uh, works well for uh, shoebox rooms, uh, rectangular rooms, but uh, on the other hand, it's not really representative of real uh, situations. So even there, uh, they trained uh, something that works in a theoretical model, but there was no um, test on actual rooms. So this left uh, quite a few, quite a big space for us to, to try to come up with a regression model that could try to estimate volume from any type of situation. Yes? So just to clarify. Uh, so we have a source somewhere in the room yeah. and the microphone. We have no idea where the, the source is, where the microphone is, and we want to estimate the volume. Yeah, so that, that's, that's the, mo the highest level of blindness that you can achieve. You don't know where you are, you don't know where the source is, how many sources there are, if there's noise, if there's no noise. Uh, we wanted to start with the least amount of assumptions as possible. Um, and then, of course, future work can start making like side assumptions and try to see semi-blind methods. We're going to get that, to that too. All right, so our proposed approach is to detect room volume blindly from signals using a convolutional neural network uh, and, form, and frame the, the problem as a regression problem. Um, so we, we aim to simulate a variety of noisy environment containing reverberant speech within the environment and represent as much range of room size as possible and as much real impulse response data as possible. So the impulse response uh, are used to synthesize, to simulate, sorry, the, the noise environments. So we uh, thought about training a network from a short single channel audio recordings, so four seconds long, uh, using different uh, SNR levels. So we uh, simulated different uh, ratios between the noise and the speech, the reverberant speech. Um, the, the main goal was to uh, evaluate the results to gain insights into the problem and try to move forward from there. Uh, the four second uh, uh, extract is also relevant for uh, real time estimation. So um, although it's not exactly real time, a four second chunk of audio is fairly fast to evaluate. Um, and that, that also part of the requirements of mixed reality as somebody moves around the building. So this is the pipeline that we set in place. Uh, I'm going to talk about each one of these steps. We collected data. We um, synthesized also some data. Then we, um, we went on with the data augmentation, simulated the noisy rooms, uh, made, made our sets, our training and uh, development and evaluation sets. Uh, we proceeded feature extraction, we trained model, we evaluated the model, and then the, that would inform us on how, do, how did the feature uh, perform in the model and then go back to extract more features or change some parameters. So data. All right, so data collection, this was definitely the most time-consuming part of the internship. Uh, where several weeks were spent into retrieving uh, uh, online uh, data sets, public data sets, and format them into something that could be given to a network. So we found 11 public uh, uh, room input response data sets and two internal data sets. Uh, we only were interested in rooms for which we had room volume information. So this proved a challenge, as in um, just a time-consuming challenge, to prune each data set from the entries which did not have that information. Uh, we had to do some custom information retrieval to, um, 
to associate that information correctly, clean up inconsistencies, parse into a single file. Boring work, but time consuming. But uh, he, he, at the end of the at the end of the data collection, we ended up with 84 unique rooms. As you can see, they, they all come from different uh, places, and they all were, were sampled at uh, different sampling frequencies. For some reason, one chose a sampling frequency of 12.780 kilohertz. It's kind of odd. But it's from 1993. It's an old data set, so maybe the standards were not as uh, set as now. Um, we resampled all this data to 16 kilohertz, I believe, uh, which is good enough for uh, speech uh, signals. So these are some stats about uh, the rooms that we, um, we obtained. So the first graph shows how many unique rooms per data set we were able to, uh, to extract. Uh, the second uh, plot shows the room volume distribution on a logarithmic scale. So the logarithmic scale wants to represent the fact that differences between um, small rooms should be treated differently than the same difference in a larger um, scale. So for example, a room that is uh, uh, 20 cubic meters can be sound very different from a room that is 40 cubic meters, but a room that is 2,000 20 cubic meters probably does not sound very different than a room that is 2,040 cubic meters. So that's why we're representing the, uh, the distribution on a logarithmic scale. Um, as you can see, the, the main problem there is that we had a gap in the middle about uh, um, available uh, room volumes in our data set, uh, which um, we fixed a little bit through uh, data simulation in Triton later on, although part of the gap still remained. Um, the last graph on the right is uh, just um, an histogram of the repetitions uh, or takes per room. So um, the, each one of these data sets took different, uh, they're all different in terms of how many positions did they record, uh, what uh, uh, speakers, equipment did they use. So, so some, um, some data sets have maybe hundreds of takes inside a single room, and some other data sets have only one take inside a room. So as a result, the final distribution of how many input response we have, it's plotted on the, on the graph on the right. And there's quite a bias towards this either small rooms, um, office size kind of room, or very large rooms, because uh, there were quite, quite a few concert halls in some of the data sets. All right, moving on. Uh, oh yeah, then uh, uh, we decided to uh, cap uh, the, the representation to 50 takes per unique room. So each unique room was represented a maximum of 50 times. So simulated data. So um, Anis managed to, together with Nikunj, to uh, simulate 50 rooms using uh, um, randomly created uh, polygons, uh, which uh, were, were shaped in a way to avoid very regular rectangular rooms. So, uh, these irregular polygons create more realistic geometries, um, and uh, they were the simulation was set up for 100 random receiver position inside this uh, um, this model, uh, and the Triton was used to simulate input responses for a, a, um, a range of volumes from 60 to more or less 3,000 cubic meters. Uh, the results of these uh, models are band limited to 2 kilohertz uh, due to the way Triton works right now. Uh, and uh, this data was used to make uh, a parallel data set where we could compare the effect of having simulated rooms against not having simulated rooms. In training. In training. Yes. Um, yeah, no simulated data was put into the test set, only in the training set. 
Right, so once, once our uh, data collection was completed, we moved on to the corpus creation. So this is, a, if you are familiar with the ACE challenge, this is a, a pretty much the same uh, setup where um, room input response, two room input responses uh, belonging to the same room were taken and one was convolved with uh, a speech extract randomly chosen and uh, the other one was, uh, was convolved with either bubble noise or ambient noise. Um, an SNR uh, was chosen between four different levels, 0 dB, plus 10 dB, plus 20 dB, and infinite, meaning that no noise was, uh, was included in some examples. Uh, the signals were added together, and then it was split into four second windows. Yes, Andrea, still the speech corpus you use it, I guess, has a certain SNR, the clean speech. Around 40 to 60 dB, 60 is a studio quality. Yeah. Yeah, so infinite is actually in relationship to the noise that we had, not to the noise that was already in the speech expert. Um, so, uh, why did you convolve the uh, noise with a room impulse response? So, to, to, um, to make the noise uh, belong to the same room as the speech signal. But then you have just a single directional noise source in the room. It's a bit weird. Yeah, that's, the that's like you place loudspeaker in a room, then you play back noise. <laughs> yeah, I I guess it's a, it's what it's a way to um, to to just uh, set up a problem from um, from a single channel perspective. Yeah, I see I see what you see, what you mean, but ha ha having a yeah in the end everything was single channel. So um, the idea it's 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 to try to come up with a simple model uh, for now. And then, uh, yeah, I, I guess one, one, one aspect which is a little bit the, a bird a little bit deeper in the ACE challenge setup is that the, the ACE challenge was recorded, or the ACE challenge, the, the corpus was generated by recording actual noise in a real room and then mixing it into mm -hmm. the signal. And what we were trying to do is generate training data that would simulate that somewhat, but the ambient noise that was in these real recordings isn't just some fan noise somewhere. There's, when I listened to it at least, I heard that there is somebody walking down the corridor because this was a public space, so they just recorded whatever was happening. So somebody's walking down a corridor, you can hear elevator pings, you can hear a door slam somewhere. So you have some transient components in the ambient noise. And so the idea was that we generate something that's similar to that type of ambient noise, but once you have these transients in your signal, you should convolve it with the with the with a impulse response from the same room, otherwise you have anechoic anechoic uh, noise mixed into that uh, into the. Uh, you have the RP sixty of the room where the noise have been recorded in planted in the noise. Yeah, but the, the noise was uh, simulated. So then, so what we did is we we had um, shape colored noise. Gaussian noise, color Gaussian noise, where the color spectrum is kind of derived from, from some of the noise recordings. So it's a dry noise. Dry noise. And then added to that some anechoic, random, impulsive sounds like office equipment stuff or footsteps, things like that. And then take that and convolve it with the impulse response so that these transient components are convolved with the and same. Mirror. Yeah. It's a, it's a compromise, but the, the thing is, uh, some of the data sets only had one impulse response, and some did have two, but we couldn't afford to discard things just because they... When, when there were more impulse responses available, we used more than just one to convert, to generate the noise, so we used up to four. But not many of those uh, recordings have more than four or five impulse responses. So it's, uh, it's a compromise. Okay. So um, after the, this process, we ended up with a, with a big corpus of data that we needed to split. So we decided to split the development and evaluation set using unique room IDs. Uh, so th this, uh, by keeping track of uh, the room where every signal belonged to, 
uh, we managed to uh, separate, uh, based on that, the um, training set from the test set. So that we made sure that the rooms present in the test set do not appear at all in the training stage. Uh, so the test set comprises the whole ACE uh, challenge data set, which is uh, good for, uh, to make uh, results more comparable uh, with, uh, with previous um, ACE-based uh, uh, papers. Um, the train and validation ratios in the development set were set to 90 and 10 percent, and we had two parallel sets with and without the Triton simulations. Um, as I said, each room was represented a maximum of 50 times, and we randomized. Uh, if, if a room, for example, had 100 uh, positions, we randomly chose 50 of them. There was, it was not an ordered uh, uh, pick. All right, so features. Um, looking at features, uh, something we did uh, uh, recently is to look at the low frequency FFT. So uh, when Will arrived, we talked a little bit about uh, uh, what might happen uh, in, the, um, in the modes. Um, so the, the geometry of the room would affect the frequency and the intensity of, a, of the modes of a room. So we tried to see if that, whether that was easily capturable by simple uh, FFT processing. So just by, taking, just by looking at the low frequency FFT from 0 to 500 hertz, uh, these are the same rooms that uh, we listened the audio example from. And uh, it can already be seen that uh, um, a small room compared to the larger rooms uh, first of all, has less uh, uh, very low frequency content. Uh, but at the same time, an interesting thing to, to look is the presence of notches and the distance between the notches. So in the smaller room, these, uh, um, the way, the, way the, the frequency of the frequency um, magnitude response, it uh, has larger periods compared to uh, the bigger rooms. So this is something that could be captured, for example, by a sepstrom, which is the last uh, plot on the right, uh, which is trying to capture how frequently these notches are and how spaced apart they, um, they are represented. In general, the capstrom gives you the speed, the spectrum changes. Yeah. It most probably will not contain much information about the, the, the dips. Right, but if the spectrum changes fast, then I would expect more dips to uh, that to that to uh, correlate with the presence uh, of bigger, of more dips. Could be, and of course there's peaks also. Like when there's more yeah. dips, there's also more peaks. Exactly, mm -hmm. peaks and dips. Um, so, so that that was part of uh, some of the features that we wanted to look at. In uh, the graph in the middle, just show some uh, sorted FFT to see uh, what is the um, essentially the energy in the in the low frequency bands, and you can see that the small room in blue here, um, the this x-axis does, does not mean much because this is all resorted, but uh, you can see a clear difference between a small room and uh, larger rooms, but uh, in this case, from the medium to the large, is not much, that much of a difference. So it's a sorted FFT, so what this is really showing, I guess, is uh, a smaller number of frequency bins account for most of the energy on the blue curve, for example? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, what means sorted FFT? So basically, we, we, we take uh, um, we, we take this, this thing and we sort it for like, uh, higher values to lower values, right? And this can tell you if, if there are many modes in a room, this curve will be flatter and uh, uh, start earlier, and this will result, it's easier to see when you that plot it that way. That's not the frequency axis. Yes. It's not the frequency axis, that's, that's, that's a type of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 the, the, the don't worry. Of, uh, magnitudes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, one idea here was also that look at the slope of the curve, that, and it's, 
because the, what bigger the room, that flatter is the response. Mm -hmm. And actually it's seen that the orange curve is flatter than the others, but it's quite small to change. So technically, you can do statistics over the frequency axis, like minimum, maximum, mean, variance, yep. and if you can go even a second order statistics there. Definitely. Yeah, there is some ground to 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 work on that, and uh, uh, later on we speak more about features. Um, the other uh, the other main thing that we wanted to look at is time frequency representations. So this is, these are two uh, different uh, uh, representations. One is a gamma tone filter bank, if I'm correct, with ERB center frequencies. Uh, and the second plot is MFCCs. So those are two different ways to, um, that are used in uh, uh, neural networks to represent audio signals. Um, in this case, there, there are different resolutions, but the idea is uh, that you can have, uh, if you have a very refined time resolution, and not as refined the frequency resolution, although that can be changed, uh, you can probably capture how each frequency channel decays through time. And that could uh, hold some good uh, uh, information about these modes or uh, just the frequency behavior in a room. So actually something to clarify, the previous slide, this, are, this is from impulse responses. These are FFTs from input responses, and these are uh, time frequency representation from speech signals. All right, so um, we decided to combine all these features in what uh, we call the feature stack. Um, we basically put together this uh, uh, representation using a, a gamma tone filter bank, um, FFT, the sorted FFT, the Sepstrom an envelope follower, and a low-pass time domain. Uh, so that was just the, the result of the gamma tone um, filter bank applied with the resolution that we wished. So with a four-second speech signal, uh, we had, uh, I think, uh, 64 bins, time bins of uh, resolution with 32 bins of hop size. This resulted in 1991 uh, time uh, instances. Uh, so everything else was tailored to be just the same size, so that can fit together into a single network. All right, so um, prediction model. We started off from what was already implemented for the T60 problem. So this is uh, from uh, the paper from Anes and Ivan, uh, where um, um, six uh, uh, layer convolutional neural network followed by a dropout layer and uh, um, fully connected layer uh, will result uh, into, um, into the neural network that actually produce uh, uh, improved results from the uh, ACE um, challenge. So we decided to start from here and then work our way into modifications to see uh, what uh, what yielded the best results. So by not being a machine learning expert, this was a good place to start um, and, uh, and further explore. So this was tailored for uh, a gamma tone ERB filter bank uh, made of 21 filters and four second windows. So that's also why we chose four second windows to be able to just uh, reuse this network uh, easily. This is a... Uh, um, a different network that we uh, adapted for the for the stack. So uh, to fit this uh, this combination of features together with the with this network, we just modified the layers to be to result into four convolutional layer, followed by a dropout and two fully connected layers, which will produce nonlinear combinations of your output. And the output is just a room volume in cubic meters. Yes, the output is a logarithm of the room volume. So everything we decide to express in, uh, as log. Um, so yeah, moving on to results. These results are very fresh. They've been, they just came yesterday out of the oven. Yesterday, today. Today, this morning, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so 
the first thing that we did is uh, to train the model just on uh, room impulse responses, not on speech signals. Because uh, the, the intuition is uh, we can uh, see just on uh, normal impulse responses whether some features perform better than others and should be technically an easier problem uh, than, um, than speech signals. So we found out that uh, generally in most cases, first of all, having the Triton data inside our set would improve slightly the, the results in almost all situations. Uh, the Gamaton uh, filter bank performed the best. Um, the MFCCs performed really bad for some reason, but we didn't play too much with the uh, parameters and settings. Um, and uh, the error metrics that uh, we're looking at in this table is uh, well, the mean square error, the uh, correlation um, factor, and what has been called the mean multiple or average multiple, which uh, Anis came as a metric. It's, it's a way uh, to say how many times are we far from the real volume. So, for example, if it's 6.4, we're 6.4 times either bigger or smaller than the real volumes on average within the test set. So, um, so and that metric is, is the, uh, the mean, taking the mean as the absolute of the logarithm of the uh, volume error. What would say 5.2 mean? Mean multiple 5.2 <coughs> means what? Means that uh, on average, our result is uh, uh, within 5.2 times bigger or smaller than the actual room volume. So if it's 1,000, it could be anywhere between 200 and 5,000. OK. Just looking at the first two lines, does it mean that you, if you just use gamaton filters, you get the best results? Better even than the stack features. That, that was true for the real for the room impulse responses for some reason, uh, but uh, as we see in the next slide, it did not uh, show up in the speech signal. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's an interesting uh, um, um, result that we see. Actually, Ville had a theory this morning that saying that uh, um, Sepstrom did not. I forgot what your theory was. Then you have the melt frequency, and oh, yeah. it, it has very poor resolution at low frequencies. And those room modes are at low frequencies. So, right. so you yeah, just, yeah. So um, moving on to the speech signals, this came in the night. Um, these are, um, I'm going to first present the most interesting results, then uh, we can go deeper if the, there's uh, people are interested in, in knowing all the cases. But uh, in this case, uh, these are the results on, uh, by using the, all the stack of features that, that I showed earlier on, uh, um, the, um, on, on the two parallel sets, with and without Triton, and uh, you can see that the results are slightly better when the simulated data is included in the, in the training set. Uh, we obtain a uh, mean square error of uh, between 0 0.4 and to 0 0.6, uh, correlation of 0 0.8. Uh, these, are, these, these use the model with the two fully connected layers uh, after four convolutional layers. Going uh, further, we, um, we experimented with different uh, um, settings uh, within the network. So these are actually the two best performing uh, situations. Uh, by variating just some of the layers, uh, we obtain a, 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 an average multiple error of 2.9. So this means we are 2.9 times off the real volume estimation. So um, you can see there's quite, uh, already from the graph, there's quite a nice division between the small rooms and uh, the bigger rooms that are in the test set. Um, the small rooms, they um, are harder to distinguish from like refined uh, changes, but at least you can get a nice separation of small, medium, and large. What's the ideal result in these 
images diagonal? Diagonal would be ideal, yeah. Yes, it's a confusion matrix. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, it chopped off the, uh, it chopped off the, uh, the x-axis. It's true yeah. log of the volume versus, versus estimated. And you can see nine vertical bars because we have nine unique rooms in the test set. Seven from this ACE challenge and then two that we, we just took from I see. from uh, one of the databases. So I uh, was, I'm, unless I misunderstood the previous slide versus the comparison between the two, it seems like the error rate is lower here. Yes. With the harder problem. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> deep, deep learning. Uh, <laughs> Uh, who knows? <laughs> there are some. There are some. Uh, there are some issues, maybe with the uh, the. So we we try to use the same framework for generating the noise signals as was used in the ACE challenge, but we applied that to noise um, noisifying impulse responses, and that's not what the ACE challenge was meant for. So it looks at the impulse response and says, "Oh, there's very little energy in your signal, which is just an impulse response." So I'm going to keep my my noise level very low, and so I don't know. Oh, you know those, those transients you put in, impulsive transients, they give you a very good estimate of the impulse response in there, right? So instead of the speech, it might be locking on to there was a lot of transients. Oh, the you background. Can, yes, the noise background. Yeah, that's also that's it could also actually give useful information to this yeah, because definitely. it was passed through the yeah. impulse response. So in the, in the previous uh, case, you just had an impulse response as signal. Yeah. So here you also have more data, probably. Actually, the data I think is the same. We have more training data. data it's well. oh, we four oh, seconds, see. right? Huh? It was four seconds. Yeah, yeah. You have you get so more data. Like like we have more instances. Oh, yeah. There is four instead of just one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. the point. And what was the SNR? This is average so of all the SNRs. Well, it's just enough range. Yeah, just to, just because it's all it's all of them. It's uh, the zero plus ten plus twenty and infinite, which means the studio recording SNR. It's actually it's, it's a little worse. It's, it's like closed mic. Some the, the the actual speech signals were not very low as okay, not very high as not, Sorry, one one thing we didn't do here is, uh, and we should probably do that for for the paper is use the actual ACE evaluation set. So now we've used the uh, now we've used these rooms that they recorded, those actual impulse responses that don't appear in our training set, but we generated our own speech signals and our own noisy speech signals. But they have recorded those in a real room yeah. with real yeah, noise. Exactly. So we should use that instead. So that whatever transients were in there we get we take advantage of if there are no transients then because now we, we probably the, the results are probably be a little bit worse because there will be Fewer transients. <clears throat> there will be fewer transients, I imagine, in the in the real evaluation set than what we have here because we gen we generated them randomly, so we just put in these whatever bits and bobs. Um, but that's something we'll have to we'll have to do for the paper. Maybe. Yeah. And it also makes it easier to reproduce. You can just say we used exactly that same data set and just apply this model to it to estimate the volume. Yes, so if uh, I'm not going to go through this slide very much, but if you want to discuss this later, uh, I'll happily bring it up. Uh, you can see the, 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 just to explain how this plot should be read intuitively, this, this is really bad. This is uh, the MFCCs. You can see that if everything is on a line, there's no, they're not really lying on the slope that we want them to lie. Um, and um, it's not on this slide, in a different slide, I'll bring it up later. Uh, we have an example where the um, training data leaked into the test set for some reason, and then you have a, this amazing prediction. Uh, and this told us like, how much this, it's important to keep a uh, room separate. Um, other uh, situations, so the, the top graphs, they all uh, different combinations or uh, small modifications of the network that I showed uh, in the previous slide. Uh, the error is more or less similar. It gets worse once uh, you take single features one at a time. Um, yep. 
Or maybe you should, you should add that. So there was a bug where training data leaked into the test data, but not to the not in the sense that the same data was there. It was just the same room appeared in both places, yeah. and that was enough to get you really nice results. Like <laughs> even 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 though you use different impulse responses, so so it was a different impulse response, a different speech signal, <clears throat> a different noise signal, but the same room in two places, and that's. A lot of prior work has done that, and they assume that well, they're separate locations, so they're independent, but they're they're really probably. I lost. I'm actually gonna show it right now. I think. It's... Oh, sorry. There you go. So the, 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 this is the uh, the result when you have a bug. When 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 the same room leaked into the test set, you have this amazing. Um, um, One point six time within the real. Volume uh, mean square error of 0 0.1, uh, correlation of one. So this is, is too good to be true. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, you start from this one because you have to bug first, right? So you get that one and think, oh, we're done. And then you realize, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I don't think it, it, it will qualify as a true blind estimation in that case. Uh, all right, so going back to where we left off. Okay, so future work, discussions, and conclusions. So there's uh, many areas of improvement that uh, we can think about. Uh, so the first, uh, um, the first thing that we can think of is whether uh, blind, truly blind estimation of room volume is necessarily the way to go. Uh, I think uh, if you uh, approach the problem from a device-specific perspective, you can, uh, you can come up with semi-blind approaches and make assumptions on uh, some of the um, room environment and the sources uh, by taking advantage of other sensors present on your device. For example, you can use uh, um, a beamforming on the talker to have a reference, so you can compare that reference to other incoming signals. Uh, make some type of multi-channel correlation feature extra extraction. Uh, you could uh, think about tracking moving sources and see how the changes through space, uh, maybe by um, uh, correlating that with camera image. Uh, some depth sensors in uh, uh, devices can give you already some kind of a local mesh of what's around you. So these these are this is all uh, food for thought for uh, more. Uh, precise and tailored solutions. Uh, data collection can be improved by having more data, of course. Uh, there was uh, that gap that I showed earlier. Uh, if um, I, Perhaps if we uh, cover the distribution a little more evenly, uh, the results could get better. Um, there's a uh, this pipeline could be reused potentially for uh, other parameters such as DRR, uh, T60 in frequency bands, or uh, the wet level that we discussed in the previous uh, meetings. Um, this will require the data to, um, to be better tailored for the task. Um, this is, this is the, actually a, a, a different way to see our current situation. Uh, these are all our 84 real rooms, and this is the volume in a log scale. Every time you see a jump, it's data that is missing. It's something we don't have a room covering this, uh, um, spanning uh, what's in between. So it would be nice for this to be as flat as possible. So feature extraction, there's uh, a lot of features that uh, we could explore and uh, look better. For example, the phase spectrum, we talked about uh, also like having some kind of spectrogram of how those, uh, uh, the incoming phase behaves. Some echo density profiles, uh, multi-channel features. We're still not entirely clear uh, how the room information can be isolated from other factors because, of course, you have uh, absorption rates, you have... Um, different uh, degrees of uh, noise environments. Our noisy environments, in the end of the day, they're kind of uh, um, similar settings. You don't have like multiple noise sources at different distances. Maybe if you have one just next to the to your microphone, then everything breaks. Um, 
so this, uh, this information is not really available in literature right now, and it's something that should be more explored uh, by having simple experiments. Uh, the network model, um, we, um, we uh, uh, so, so I did not talk about this very much earlier, but having a stacked features uh, with uh, different uh, unrelated uh, uh, features that should not be convolved together meant that all our convolution happened in one dimension and not in two dimensions. Uh, so maybe perhaps there could be some kind of hybrid network that could uh, perform a 2D convolution just on the gamma-tone part and the 1D on the others. I don't know whether that's possible or not. Too much uh, uh, experience with uh, this sort of problem, but it's something to look into. Um, maybe uh, the loss function can be uh, changed within the network to include some form of perceptual tolerance of how uh, how bad should uh, uh, the estimated label be compared to the to the real volume. So we don't know yet what's our tolerance and how important is that we are close to the uh, to the real value. Um, and of course, we can always explore and change some of the settings within our, our net current models. So further discussion is, uh, of course, how accurate do we need to be in estimating room volumes? There's been no perceptual studies that looked at the room volume discrimination, uh, J and Ds. Uh, well, there, there has been some studies for discrimination in terms of classification, but not in terms of regression. So, for example, what if we have um, uh, a room with the same uh, absorption coefficient but different sizes? What is the J and D that we can discriminate the size of this room? Um, there's a, a lack of a data set able to isolate this parameter from other elements right now. So this would be a good place to uh, research uh, to try to understand how important is perceptually the, um, the estimation of the room volume. And if it's used to just compute other parameters, then the, the, some correlation should be drawn between uh, the, um, the parameters uh, uh, estimated using the volume, using the estimated volume, uh, and uh, other uh, forms of estimating the same parameter. So that could tell you whether it's worth to use volume as a proxy for, for example, the critical distance, or just rethink the whole thing and just try to estimate the critical distance. Um, so the other question is, should this be, in the first place, an audio problem? Um, well, we know that uh, audio is more generalizable for uh, different types of situations and devices, not just for mixed reality headsets, but computers, laptops, telephones, all sorts of uh, technology, technological devices that possess a microphone. Uh, computer vision can, uh, of course, help to estimate or cross-validate the room size estimation. This is just an image from the NYU depth data set that it's something that, uh, just to throw an idea of how image could help um, labeling uh, the size of a room. Uh, however, then uh, you start introducing assumptions and uh, you still have to fight with limitations of actual technology, like depth cameras maybe don't go very far. Uh, there are visual obstacles might be in your room, um, and uh, there, 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 there's, there's another degree of error that uh, you would have to account for. Uh, something that uh, um, has been, uh, so somebody once uh, explained me this idea that uh, if you, you could have just a um, cloud server with the room size information of all sorts of Places that are being cataloged are ready by engineers, and then you just download your input response on your device. This, this could be a different way to go. But uh, going through the audio um, approach was, uh, was our goal. So the conclusions that we can draw from this uh, internship is that blind room volume estimation is a hard problem. A good solution has not been yet found, but some insights were gained. Uh, multiple feature representations seem to be bring better results than just a single uh, time frequency representation. Um, and uh, adding simulating data uh, did improve uh, accuracy and reduce the, the um, average uh, dis uh, multiple distance error. Um, so, so this also, um, as a future outlook, uh, having more Triton data or having a uh, 
uh, maybe the future iteration when maybe Adam work is implemented together could even go uh, even bring uh, more accurate uh, simulations to uh, to improve our data set. Um, still some work ahead, but uh, to our knowledge, this is the first regression model for the blind estimation of room volume. So this is uh, there was no baseline to compare against, and um, there's, there's still like a big space to to move inside of it. So that's that's something positive. Uh, similar framework as the AC challenge makes the results more comparable for future attempts uh, and more um, for, for literature and the community is a little more um, uh, attractive. And that would be all. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot to Anis because uh, he helped me inside and outside of the lab. Uh, thanks to all the group. I had a, a really great time to be here this summer. Thanks to the interns. Uh, thanks to Ville to, for visiting us. And I hope our interactions will continue in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that nice presentation. Um, one comment on um, the features it was one of the last slides um, where you mentioned um, echo, that echo density um, would be a good feature. So I think this is what mainly characterizes um, the, the room volume. So because you showed that you can have the same reverberation time but different room volumes. And in a large room you will have uh, a much less density of echoes than in a small room. Um, so, but I think you can also determine this from the frequency response because you have more, you'll have more room modes or more dips in a, if you have a higher echo density. So this is probably the strongest feature that you can use. And okay. just as a as an idea for for a future work, so it would be probably so we we saw you can somehow estimate the reverberation time. So it would probably make sense to jointly estimate reverberation time and room volume. Mm -hmm. And then you could go maybe even further and also just to have like three or four outputs to even then estimate the DRR and uh, or probably the source distance. So these are probably three, four parameters. If you can manage them all together, then probably you have also less confusions between room volume and reverberation time or something like this. Mm -hmm. And would really give a nice characterization of the acoustic scene, so that would be a nice thing if that would be possible. Maybe one comment on the echo density. Unfortunately, we can't calculate that from speech signals. So for impulse responses, that would be great. But yeah, but um, um, you, don't, you don't need to, to uh, um, calculate specifically the echo density, but um, for example, you can see this in, in the uh, frequency response of the impulse response. So you have more dips and yeah. Yeah. more okay. modes if you yeah. have a higher density. I guess, I guess maybe to turn the question around, maybe echo density could be one of the outputs of the model. Yeah, for example, yeah. Okay. yeah. So in general, this is called multi-style training. And if you force your network to estimate stuff which you may not even need, this helps the network to train better. So I guess adding additional reverberation parameters on the output can improve the room, uh, the room volume itself, yeah. even if you don't use the others. But really the, the idea of looking at five, 500 first hertz or lowest hertz is and taking the gaps to move them was about really what you said. Yeah. That the, echo density brings, or how do those echoes come in, they kind of shapes the, takes the response, and then you see it in that case too. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely a low hanging fruit to, to implement. Just uh, try and make, even, even just try on input responses and see whether we can, we should follow this, this idea further. So average capstone may not be that much useful, but if you plot the magnitude as function of the time, so frequency means time per the frame, it may give you some some information. 
Yeah, well, speech signals definitely would be better than just a single uh, section. This, this is on, on an input response. So maybe maybe it's okay to average it on the input response, but yeah. Well, it's classic classic application of the Capstrom analysis, at least in the speech front end, is you do averaging across the time, which presumably is the Capstrom filter, and you subtract it, and what's left is the pure signal, means removing the impulse response between the source and the microphone, assuming that the speech has basically a zero average Capstrom, and then the only thing remains is the impulse response. That mean can be eventually useful because this is in general the Capstrom of the impulse response. Right. So, I, I, we, we touched this earlier, uh, but uh, we wanted to generalize on something that uh, does not make assumptions about uh, the capability of a specific device. Uh, but also, uh, there is, uh, I mean, me personally, I don't know much about how would such device, uh, like a camera, for example, perform into estimating volume if you have obstacles around you or if you're facing a wall. Um, you still have uh, similar types of problems that uh, uh, might occlude your um, vision. So um, it makes sense to want to, that we want to try uh, an audio-only um, situation. Cool. All right, no more questions. All right, thanks a lot.